Welcome to Canontel 420. Everything here is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not promote or encourage the use, sale, or cultivation of cannabis where prohibited by law. Always follow your local, state, and tribal regulations and consume responsibly where legal to do so. OG Kush is more than a name on a jar. It's the backbone of modern cannabis culture, a strain that reshaped how people experience the plant both chemically and socially. When it took hold in the 1990s, it wasn't recognized for some exaggerated high, but for its balance. The original expressions carried a terpene structure built on three consistent pillars, myrcene, limonene, and humulene. Each of these compounds engages the endocannabinoid system in its own way, but their collective synergy is what gave OG Kush its cultural gravity. Myrcene connected the body to deeper calm, limonene lifted mood and mental space, and humulene grounded the entire experience with an herbal restraint that kept it honest. Together they produced a spectrum that felt complete, body-heavy yet expansive, deeply restorative without sedation, cerebral without spiraling. What made OG Kush unique wasn't just the chemistry, it was how that chemistry translated into lived experience. The strain carried a layered depth, a head buzz that sharpened focus, a body weight that eased anxiety, and a rhythm that made each encounter distinct. It was cannabis as an ecosystem rather than a formula, a full expression instead of a singular effect. Before terpene language became a marketing tool, people already understood OG Kush by instinct. It could hold the weight of creativity one day and cradle sleeplessness the next, versatility that turned it into both a connoisseur's compass and a cultural signature. That depth was inseparable from its origin. OG Kush wasn't born in a lab, it was a cultural export from the Los Angeles underground. Its rise paralleled the spread of West Coast cannabis identity, loud, resinous flower that carried both potency and personality. In that context, OG Kush became reputation, a shared myth passed by word of mouth before legality or analytics could define it. The name itself moved faster than any data sheet could carried by rappers, growers, and those who saw cannabis as more than a commodity. To smoke OG Kush was to participate in a movement, a ritual where chemistry and culture intertwined, and the West Coast carved out its creative independence from the rest of the nation. But as legalization spread and mass breeding intensified, OG Kush met the same fate that overtook many originals, flattening. The pursuit of THC dominance and flashy phenotypes stripped away the terpene balance that gave the cultivar its character. What's sold today under the same name often bears little resemblance, high THC but hollow in tone, the nuance lost to genetic dilution and market convenience. What once represented harmony now gets written off as just another heavy indica, a label that completely misreads its history. The original plant was never about sedation. It was about equilibrium, about finding the midpoint between the mind and body that defined its generation. This erosion of depth isn't a random drift. It's a reflection of how the industry simplifies stories for speed and sales. THC numbers became shorthand for value. The language of lab results replaced the intuition of growers. Branding favored slogans over substance and the industry traded cultural accuracy for shelf appeal. OG Kush became a product descriptor, not a lineage, marketed as potent and predictable instead of complex and human. That's where this discussion begins. Understanding OG Kush in its full, multidimensional form lets us see what's been lost in translation and how modern cannabis can reclaim its roots by respecting that spectrum. If OG Kush represented balance, Jack Herrer represented clarity. When it arrived in the mid-1990s, named after the activist and author of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, it embodied not only a phenotype, but a philosophy. Jack Herrer wasn't a strain for escape. It was a strain for awakening. The man behind the name had spent decades confronting stigma, advocating for hemp's industrial potential and cannabis's medical legitimacy. 
Naming a cultivar after him made it impossible to separate effect from message. Smoking Jack was participation in the push toward enlightenment. It stood as the counterpoint to the Kush era, carrying a sharper, brighter tone, both chemically and culturally. Its pine-forward clarity mirrored its namesake's conviction, a reminder that the plant's evolution has always been tied to the people willing to defend it. And that's where the contrast begins, between balance and focus, between roots and reform, between the chemistry that shaped O.G. Kush and the consciousness that carried Jack Herrer. While O.G. Kush embodied density and resinous layering, Jack Herrer introduced a cleaner, brighter articulation of the same biological conversation. Beneath their apparent differences, both cultivars share a biochemical foundation. Myrcene, limonene, and humulene remain present in the volatile oil spectrum, forming the connective tissue between them. Yet, Jack Herrer's defining separation came through its dominant terpene, terpenoline, a compound less common in most modern commercial cannabis, yet chemically responsible for the strain's sharp, pine-forward brilliance. Terpenoline behaves differently than the sedative-leaning terpenes that dominate contemporary hybrids. It's classified as a monoterpene, produced early in the MEP pathway within glandular trichomes, where the plant synthesizes smaller, highly volatile molecules designed for defense and signal exchange. Unlike myrcene, which slows neural activity and enhances permeability at the blood-brain barrier, terpinaline acts more like an aromatic stimulant, binding weakly at CB1-adjacent receptor sites and influencing dopaminergic tone through olfactory signaling. This is why the experience it creates doesn't manifest as energy in the physical sense, but as clarity, a lifted, mentally unobstructed state often mistaken for stimulation. That distinction is critical. Users never described Jack Herrer as a jittery or overwhelming high. They described it as light, coherent, and breathable. It was cannabis that allowed focus rather than distraction. The common misconception of Jack as a daytime sativa emerged not from its chemistry, but from a linguistic shortcut. Early testing linked it to Hay's dominant ancestry, and dispensary culture translated that lineage into energy. In truth, what most consumers felt was not activation of the sympathetic nervous system, but the absence of fog, terpenoline's ability to create mental airflow rather than acceleration. When viewed through a modern analytical lens, Jack, Hearer, and O.G. Kush exist on parallel axes of modulation rather than opposite ends of a spectrum. O.G. Kush's early phenotypes achieved equilibrium through terpene ratio stability, balancing sedative and uplifting molecules to hold the mind and body in symmetry. Jack Hearer reached the same internal coherence through inversion, a lighter molecular load yielding the same structural outcome. Myrcene remained to bridge body-mind transition. Limonene contributed emotional elevation, and humulene supplied grounding restraint. But terpinaline redirected the ensemble's output toward cognitive precision instead of physical relaxation. This is why, despite being boxed into opposite ends of the indica sativa binary, their real distinction lies in kinetic distribution, not categorical function. Both operate in the liminal space between stimulation and sedation, territory defined by adaptability and ratio, rather than taxonomy. The old vernacular of head high versus body high collapses here, because both cultivars demonstrate that cannabis effects are relational, not fixed. However, the cultural packaging erased that nuance. As cannabis moved from underground to market, Jack Hearer was flattened into a motivational brand archetype, a wake-and-bake strain marketed for daytime use. Dispensaries leaned on lineage names and buzzwords rather than biochemical literacy, translating a profile rooted in terpinaline's light aromatic diffusion into the simplistic notion of energy. The educational gap widened, consumers expecting a caffeine-like surge instead found a quiet alertness that improved task orientation and short-term recall, but lacked the physical charge implied by advertising. Yet, even within that distortion, Jack Herrer sustained its credibility. 
Across multiple cannabis cups, it consistently measured among the highest in terpinaline concentration, often exceeding 30% of total terpene content, reinforcing that its identity was not myth, but measurable chemistry. From Amsterdam seed banks to California dispensaries, it became the bridge between the activist culture of the 1980s and the emerging medical and legal markets of the 2000s. Its staying power reflects the human preference for clarity over chaos. People return to it not for energy, but for precision. The consequence of its mislabeling extends beyond Jack Herrer itself. It reveals the foundational flaw in cannabis taxonomy. The binary of indica and sativa, inherited from morphological classification rather than chemical reality, fails to describe how these compounds interact in the body. When culture replaces molecular dialogue with marketing shorthand, entire generations learn cannabis through expectation instead of evidence. Jack Herer was marketed as the daylight counterpart to O.G. Kush, the daytime sativa, the bright mirror of Kush's supposed heaviness. Dispensaries leaned on its haze lineage to sell the image of pure energy, the strain that could launch productivity and creativity. Cultural shorthand turned it into a contrast piece. If O.G. Kush was the night, Jack Herrer was the day. But that framing stripped away its substance. The true effect of Jack was never about physical propulsion. It was about mental calibration. The terpinaline dominant composition carved open the headspace with quiet precision, replacing inertia with lucidity. Labeling that as energy was chemically inaccurate, a distortion of how monoterpenes actually modulate neurotransmission. Terpinaline does not activate in the same adrenergic fashion as caffeine or THC-dominant hybrids. It diffuses thought patterns through light dopaminergic tone and aromatic limbic response, producing focus, not adrenaline. That misinterpretation may seem semantic, but it reshaped entire consumer behaviors. A patient avoiding OG Kush because they associate indica with sedation could be rejecting the very cultivar capable of softening their anxiety without impairment. Conversely, a novice selecting Jack Herrer expecting a stimulant jolt may encounter a calm attentiveness instead, a contemplative high that feels inward rather than kinetic. These mismatches don't originate in the flower. They originate in the framework. The industry taught consumers to expect polarity when the chemistry expresses continuity. Both O.G. Kush and Jack Herrer reveal how modern cannabis culture mistook lineage for function. Their shared backbone of myrcene, limonene, and humulene connects them more than their marketing divisions ever could. Cush's balance represented how terpene harmony can stabilize both body and cognition, while Jack demonstrated how terpinaline redirects that same framework toward mental clarity. They are not opposites, but iterative outcomes of similar biosynthetic logic, one weighted toward equilibrium, the other toward expansion. The insistence on separating them into indica and sativa reflects a cultural addiction to simplification rather than a scientific truth about the plant. This simplification carries long-term consequences. It shaped three generations of consumers and continues to influence dispensary scripts. A bud tender parroting these terms is not merely repeating marketing language. They're reinforcing a neural map of expectation that alters perception itself. When a customer is told to anticipate heaviness or stimulation, the mind preconditions the outcome, filtering the experience through confirmation bias. The result is a culture trained to feel its myths rather than its molecules. The historical roots of this binary lie in 18th, and 19 the century botany, when cannabis sativa and cannabis indica were morphological distinctions, not psychotropic descriptors. Sativa referred to tall, narrow-leafed cultivars from equatorial zones. Indica described shorter, broader-leafed plants adapted to high altitude and temperate regions. Neither category predicted effect. Over time, as underground breeding blurred these morphological traits, the language detached from its origin and drifted into retail shorthand, indica for sedation, sativa for stimulation. This was convenient, marketable, and wrong. O.G. Cush dismantles that myth by example. 
In its original form, it delivered balance, physical ease, and mental composure in equal measure, yet was reduced to the cartoon image of a couch lock strain. One. Jack Herer followed the same trajectory in reverse. Its terpinaline driven composure was rebranded as an energetic sativa, an up cultivar for mornings and workdays. Both became props in a binary that ignored the biochemistry that defined them. When expectation leads experience, consumers stop reading the plant and start reading the label. The conversation becomes cultural rather than chemical. Chemistry, not category, dictates outcome. The human endocannabinoid system is not organized by taxonomy. It's a receptor network responsive to ratios. The interaction between myrcene's permeability enhancement, limonene's serotonergic modulation, humulene's anti-inflammatory pathways, and terpinaline's cognitive diffusion determines the experiential character. Minor shifts in terpene ratio, oxidative degradation, or harvest timing can reshape that profile completely. No two batches are chemically identical, and no binary classification can capture that fluidity. This is why terpene literacy must replace outdated taxonomy. For consumers, literacy means reading the jar like a chemistry label, identifying dominant compounds, learning their functional tone, and pairing effect with intention. It transforms the act of selection from myth-based to evidence-based. For buttenders, it means evolving from sales agents to interpreters of chemistry, guiding dialogue through measurable traits rather than inherited folklore. And for the broader culture, it marks the return to respect, treating the plant not as a brand archetype, but as a living chemical system capable of infinite variation. The stories of O.G. Cush and Jack Herer are not nostalgia, they are proof. Both reveal that cannabis cannot be confined to two words inherited from colonial taxonomy. The Indica Sativa framework was designed for convenience, not accuracy, and the longer it persists, the more it obstructs understanding. If the goal is to represent the plant honestly, to teach, to cultivate, to heal, then that language must evolve. Cannabis is not divided, it is plural. The future of comprehension lies in ratio, resonance, and literacy. And these two cultivars, once mislabeled opposites, stand as twin reminders that truth begins when marketing ends. And that brings us full circle. What started as two strains, often treated as opposites, reveals a shared truth about how deeply misunderstood cannabis still is. O.G. Cush and Jack Hearer both remind us that chemistry, not branding, defines the experience. When we start reading the plant for what it actually expresses, its terpenes, its ratios, its living biology, we move closer to understanding cannabis as a system, not a slogan. If you took something from this breakdown, let that be it. The plant is always more honest than the marketing. Every aroma, every tone of effect, every shift between body and mind, those are data points written in chemistry, waiting to be read. The more we learn to interpret them, the less we'll need the outdated binaries that kept people guessing for decades. Thanks for spending some time with me here on Canna Intel 420. If you found this deep dive useful or learned something new about these cornerstone cultivars, make sure to like, subscribe, and share it with someone who still thinks that indica means indicouch or sativa means adrenaline. We've got a lot more coming, each episode pushing deeper into the chemistry, culture, and history of the plant itself. This content is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not promote or encourage the use, sale, or cultivation of cannabis where prohibited by law. Always follow your local, state, and tribal regulations and consume responsibly where legal to do so. All narration and sound design are original. No third-party music or licensed tracks are used. I'll see you all in the next one where we keep uncovering the real language of the plant. Until then, stay curious, stay grounded, and keep your mind clear.